Stugatz here. Diehard batteries are like the rare breed of athlete that always plays with a lot of power, but you could also depend on to be on the field game after game. Yes, me? That's the type of performance you want under your hood. So head to Advanced Auto Parts where you can get the reliability, durability, and power of Die Hard with free testing and installation from advanced team members. Advance your auto and advance auto parts and participating car quest locations. See stores for details. Hey everybody, welcome to the local hour, and I know what you're hoping for in the local hour. Don't worry, you're gonna get it in the big suey. Heat reaction, cocaine mic, heat homerism, all that is coming your way. Um, we'll see if the urinator makes an appearance, but the Miami Heat are up 2-0 against the best team in basketball. It's exciting times down here for South Florida sports fans in general. I had three TVs working overtime last night, and I'm so excited. Inter-Miami came away with a point on the road. David Sampson, I know you were glued to Inter-Miami, Atlanta United on FS1, a nil-nil affair, a regional rival, big-time point for Inter-Miami. That was a huge moment. I couldn't decide whether I was more excited to get the one away point for Inter Miami or when Jimmy Butler's second free throw with no time left went in. That was just for good measure. I mean, it, it, insane game. I, I I know this is going to sound like a knee jerk reaction and hyperbolic, but I can't remember a game in my lifetime in which more people were sent to the free throw line because they were fouled on a jump shot. It was insanity. Great game. Exciting times down here because you have the Marlins inexplicably in a playoff chase. Well, not inexplicably. The The explanation is that their record is good enough to be in this chase uh, because the playoff expansion and 60 games is just such a mutation of the sport that you have a handful of teams that over the course of a full regular season might prove to be bad in the thick of this. San Diego might have actually been legitimately good this year. But San Francisco's hanging around. Philadelphia is probably a team that I don't think many would have had in the in the thick of the playoff chase as they are right now. You look at, I mean, even the Tigers uh, are pretty good. David, what is your take on this season? Should I just enjoy it for what it is? Should a part of me be like, well, this is such a mutation of the sport. I can't take this seriously. Well, it depends What kind of person are you in general when you look at your glass in the morning because you are acting pretty half empty right now and that's disappointing because as a South Florida fan, we got to take it the way we can get it, when we can get it, how we can get it. If it's a phantom foul by Giannis, you take it. The fact is, I, I just would take umbrage with one thing you said to start this show. The Bucks are not the best team in basketball. They may have the best record in basketball, but they are not playing like the best team in basketball by any stretch since this bubble started. The Heat are a better team. It does remind me of the Marlins when when we won in 03. I hate to go back to it, but people said, "Oh, we're, we shouldn't be favored against the Cubs or the Giants." Or the I don't. I, I really don't. Than they were. I don't. I really don't think you hate to go back to it. No. Well, listen. It's just that people didn't realize we were better than they were. The Heat are a great team. They've got shooters. They've got defenders. They've got playmakers. I just thought that the referees played a role that that the NBA is going to have to look at this and say, is this the game we want? Do we want the referees thinking about calls every time a jump shooter jumps up? Do we want the sort of touch fouls? Do we want the inconsistency? When you watched game seven of the Rockets Thunder last night, the referees let so much go. There was so much frenetic i don't know if you stayed up late enough because oh, yeah. I, I did and i'm sure you did too i, I did there was I, insanity i actually they had a problem the whistles. i actually had a problem with scott foster not teeing up chris paul at the end because chris paul was talking to him in a way that absolutely deserved a technical i i know you said phantom foul by Giannis, and i think if in a vacuum i show you that play and say hey this is going to be a call that's made with zero time on the clock without the context of the rest of the game you're probably saying, who makes that call in that spot? I think immediately on the heels of that inexplicable call that Steve Javi, Steve Javi, I've had a problem with since he was officiating Nick's Heats games uh, in, in, 20 years ago. Steve Javi, to back that call up, you do not make that call in that spot. You don't make that call in any spot. That was great defense by Goran Dragic. Credit to Doris Burke for calling him out because he's he's supposed to be the end-all and be-all there. When you have Steve Javi, a rules expert, you sort of defer to him. Doris Burke was not having it, David. Because it was outrageous. 
First of all, the fact that Middleton hit the free the three free throws that is not as relevant to me because that that's hard to do. Just FYI, to hit three in a row, uh, but that's not a foul at that point in the game of a conference semifinals, even a game two. Forget a game seven or a game one or whatever game you just don't call it. And the Giannis foul. If anyone who's saying right now that that wasn't a makeup call doesn't understand how games go. That was a makeup call on Giannis and it was the right thing to do because the right team won that game. The Heat should have won that game, but they should have won it not on Butler's free throws with no time left on the clock. I think I agree with every single one of your takes. It was a makeup call. I I don't think that without the context, like I said, without the context of the rest of the game, I, I think that's a bad call. But when you hold it in direct comparison to what immediately happened before it with that Dragic foul call, the Giannis thing looks like a flagrant foul compared to, to what happened with Goran Dragic. So, better team won. Miami Heat made us nervous at the end. Jimmy Butler, for the love of God, call timeout. But we will get to extreme heat reaction in the Big Suey. Let's give some attention to these Miami Marlins. And I, you're rooting for the Marlins, right? You're, you're rooting for this yes. season, even though, I mean, I think a large chunk of you doesn't want Derek Jeter to have any success professionally. I don't know if, if you consider yourself a professional rival. How You must be conflicted watching this team. You've spoken about it here with me on the, on the local hour. But are you getting sort of sucked in by this playoff chase as mutated as it is? I'm rooting for Michael and I'm rooting for other people in the organization. I think there's seven of them left who Jeter hasn't fired. I'm not rooting for Jeter on the business side at all uh, because I want, obviously, by comparison, I want people and him to realize that, hey, maybe, and this is selfish of me to say, and I'm honest with you, I, I, I don't want him to all of a sudden be selling out and all of a sudden get a huge TV deal and all of a sudden get a naming rights deal because even though it's three years later, it, it just makes me look less competent. And the more that he can't do what he says he could do better than I did, the better I feel. But that's off the field. <laughs> that honestly. is so honest. I appreciate true, I appreciate the transparency because, look, many people might accuse you of that and you're like just wearing it. Yep, absolutely true. I don't know who would accuse me of that. I mean, that's if you don't have some bit of schadenfreude in you, then you're just not looking deep enough. And so do do I have happiness at his misfortunes every single time? Do I gloat about it every single time? However, you know, in a contract year for Mike Hill, who is someone who I care about and I want and for the fans of South Florida, Listen, I wanted to win every year that I was there and they haven't won in so long. It's been 17 years. That means the way I've always looked at it is generationally. And take my son who was born in 03, in June of 03. So he never got to, he he obviously didn't remember 03. I never was able to have him at an October game. I never was able to show him playoff games and everybody born his year. They're now seniors in high school. And I can't stand the fact that there could be children who get born and then go to school and become adults and never saw their team make the playoffs. So I want the Marlins to make the playoffs this year, not just for him, but for everybody in South Florida, whether it's a 60 game season or not, you, if you're in it, you're in it. And no one remembers how many people in Los Angeles who were seniors in high school in 1981 say to themselves, man, that was a strike shortened season. That was not fun at all. That was split season. It wasn't real. Forget it. You're the world champion. You want to hear something pathetic and sad? In my lifetime, I have a memory of one Cleveland Browns playoff game. One. It- in your whole life, forget your school life. You're talking about your whole life. My whole life. My whole life. Because remember, they went away and became the Ravens, and it was a couple of years before they came back, and the Ravens immediately became good and went on to win two Super Bowls. Um, you can tell that stayed with me a little bit. During that transitional time, I actually supported the Miami Dolphins, and they made the playoffs. But in terms of like my absolute passion, my Cleveland Browns, they made the playoffs in, I believe it was 2001, Um, And it was a heartbreaking game, a loss, a comeback victory by the Pittsburgh Steelers, the hated rival. And uh, that is my one playoff memory of the the team alongside Chelsea that I just support the most. So, yeah, I feel terrible for your son. I am. Are you is Art Modell the most hated owner or is it Jeffrey in your career? Oh, boy, it is art. It is art. Quite, 
quite easily, and I do not like Jeffrey. All respect to you, but no, I understand. yeah, I, I I don't like Jeffrey at all. Uh, but Art Art was way worse. Art was. Way do worse. you remember for the for the listeners who don't know Art Modell under cover of night in theory, although of course it's not true. But there were moving trucks that were brought to Cleveland and you and there was video, as I recall, of those moving trucks in the dark, moving stuff out of Cleveland into Baltimore. Do you have an, any how old were you when that happened? I was I want to say I was probably nine years old. I remember having the sports. I hung up that Sports Illustrated cover that was made a character, uh, a caricature of Art Modell. I hated Art Modell. I would throw darts at it i legitimately i had a dartboard in my room i put it on the dartboard uh yeah i mean he ripped away the the football team that i loved that that i loved i didn't really grab the scope of it and i do remember sort of instantaneously there was already talk about the nfl was going back to cleveland this will not stand because everybody agreed in the way that it went down and leveraging the stadium situation and, and the city of cleveland was willing to give a stadium it seemed as though he just balked at the entire negotiation and wasn't at all serious about keeping that team in Cleveland, much like you wore a cowboy hat to, to recruit other cities. He got swept up in it, and his heart was set on Baltimore. And um, look, it's worked out for that franchise. And Art Modell, plenty of people say that he should be a Hall of Famer because of the contributions to the game. And if you look at it, it's hard to argue. But I think that that sin, for me, is too much to overcome. Um, I, I will always forever hold a grudge, um, even though he's long gone now. Um, that one's tough. Jeffrey, I didn't like because I felt like Jeffrey was just openly lying to me. I just, I, I, I know Deadspin had the whole thing. Well, let's talk about the Deadspin um, article that sort of, they, they got their hands on some of your financials. and That the was revenue. a nightmare. Yeah. That and, was one of my worst days of my career. Can we talk about it? And for the uninitiated, can you explain exactly what happened there with the Deadspin story? So we're we're a private company. While people like you and fans think that it's a public company and you should know everything that goes on, the reality is that you don't because we have our own financials and it is completely private how much money is spent on various things, how much money is won, how much money is lost. The every company has financial statements. Uh, baseball is interesting in that we've got several auditors every year who audit the financial statements. The union gets a look at the financial statements. The league gets a look at the financial statements. And of course, we as a, as a company get your financial statements. I had to sign every year the financial statements to say as president of the team that I have read them because they come not just with numbers, but there's also pros in financial statements where you explain different categories, explain different numbers, and you have to represent. It is a legal document where you are representing that certain things are happening and here's why the numbers are the numbers. But those financial statements are absolutely private. In a public company where you buy shares of stock, you can see a company's financial statements and audited financial statements. So one day, I am uh, doing whatever it is I do. And when you get a call from PJ Loyello, who is the head of communications, generally the calls are because something's going on. It's not, hey, how you doing? It's all right, we had a player arrested or we have to deal with something that happened or did you hear what the owner said? Or did you hear what's going on in baseball? You're going to have to respond or you have an interview request. There's something going on. In my wildest dreams, it never occurred to me that I would get a phone call from PJ saying, we have a serious problem. What was going on is we were trying to get a ballpark and we had made uh, statements and I had made statements that the Marlins were losing money. And I had been very consistent about that. And I would never get into details about how much I would never get into details about my definition of losing money. I would say that I worked for an individual owner. And when the owner has to write a check at the end of the year, that to me is losing money. When an owner gets money given to him at the end of the year, that's making money. That's the definition to me of making money or losing money because that's how our owner defined it. And that is what I would have to do at the end of the year is say, hey, could you wire in $17 million? Or, hey, we need your wire instructions. We're sending you $17 million. So the call comes in and says, David, um, it looks as though Deadspin is about to print 
our financial statements. And I said, that can't be true. Obviously, they're not real because there's no way that they would have them. It's impossible. We had never given them to the public. And the public had asked for our financial statements during the negotiation for the stadium. And we were a hard no. And we had a lot of criticism from people like you and, and Dan and, and everyone in the media and all the fans because because there's a voyeuristic quality to seeing someone else's financial statements. It's like looking when someone buys you dinner and you want to look at the check to see how much it is so you can see how much the person's tipping. Everybody sort of does that look, even though they claim they don't, but they do. So now multiply that by a thousand. That is how badly people want to see financials. How much does Samson get paid or how much money are they making or losing? So Deadspin somehow got the financial statements of the Florida Marlins and they chose to write an article and go public and only show three years where the Marlins were making money and they didn't show the entire financial statement. They only chose and cherry picked certain parts of it to write an article that the Marlins were liars. And it was a firestorm. I, I had never been a part of anything like that, truthfully, to this day. What were the consequences? I imagine you heard from a lot of pol uh, politicians because you were negotiating a stadium deal and you were crying poor. So at that point, you're probably thinking, oh, no, this deal is on life support. I, I might not be able to get a stadium. So let me tell you what I did. I think I can sit. Um, we had to decide how we were going to handle this. And I made the decision over the objection of Jeffrey's PR advisor, of PJ, and of Jeffrey. I went behind everyone's back. And I sat down with a writer for the Miami Herald with our actual financial statements year by year by year because I wanted that writer who had been incredibly negative toward us. His name, he still writes for the Herald. His name is Doug Hanks. We chose the Herald and we chose him as the business writer because we thought he had the best opportunity to look at financial statements, listen to me talk, and then write an article disputing what Deadspin had written. We couldn't let it go. Normally, when something bad happens, you put it away and you don't make it worse by bringing it up again. But this story became so big and it got in the way of us getting a ballpark because the public and the commissioners and the mayor, everyone lost their mind because they had cover, which was, yeah, they're not showing us our statements. So what can we say? We got to believe them. But now they saw these statements and said, wait a minute, you don't need public money. So it was bad. Did you threaten to sue Deadspin? No, we only threatened to sue Deadspin over that, uh, over my um, racial comments mm -hmm. that went public yeah. uh, when I was taped incorrectly. That yeah. then we had we lawyered up and threatened to sue for the and end. it wasn't me. So yeah, yeah, it That's wasn't a you. Different story. Yeah, it's a, a different story. Um, but we sat with the Herald. We went through the financials, and Doug Hanks wrote a front page article because Deadspin missed. It did not properly explain our financial statements because in them, it explained exactly where the money went, that w where the profit went, the years the Marlins were profitable. It went to pay down debt, yeah. the debt that we needed to reborrow in order to put money into the stadium. You didn't show these financials to politicians. You just mentioned that. So obviously my mind goes to the place. Well, one of these big teams that was paying the Marlins all that rev share money leaked this. You know, I didn't spend until this second one minute considering who leaked it uh, because really? I've never, I've always been a consequentialist. So why would I spend a second worrying about who did something when I had to deal with the fact that it was done? It's like when the genie's out of the bottle, am I going to spend time figuring out why someone rubbed the lamp? No, I got to deal with the fact that I got to do my three wishes now. I, I actually am jealous of that trait because you just deal with the task at hand and all your bandwidth is devoted to, all right, how do we fix this? Because a large part of me would be so pissed and I would not trust anybody in major league baseball because that's the obvious place. So now that you're thinking about it for the first time, 
Does that make sense, that theory? Uh, it could have been from agents. It could have been from the union. It could have been from an owner who didn't like us or who didn't want us to succeed. It could have been from owners who were trying to get ballparks and couldn't and were upset. It could have been from cities. It, it could have been from any myriad places. Do I think that someone would directly try to hurt our bid to get a stadium? You're damn right I do. Because we did things that baseball was not necessarily comfortable with throughout the years. We did things that people were not comfortable with. We were involved in that transaction in 02 that upset a lot of people within baseball. Uh, there were a lot of people who didn't want John Henry to get the Red Sox within baseball. I mean, there's a, there's a lot that went on over the years. So could someone have purposely tried to make it so we would either wouldn't get a ballpark or would have to put more money in? Yeah, but again, why spend a second on that, Mike? Because it's it's such a waste of energy when there's such a premium on hours in the day. I want to stay here for a little bit because there were obviously political ramifications, um, ramifications internally. I'm sure there were people, high-ranking officials within your own organization that were sort of caught off guard by exactly what was in some of these financials. But it seemed as though you guys were kind of punished by Major League Baseball because you mentioned the Players Association. You guys were forced to inject a little bit more money into that. Was that a residual effect of this scandal or was that something different, David? That was yet another scandal. Uh, I can't <laughs> I got called by uh, Rob Manford and this was before he was commissioner and there was an issue. And unfortunately here in Miami, you're very Miami centered, but in baseball, Miami's one of 30 teams, the union and the, the owners were fighting about revenue sharing proceeds. What, what the rules say is all these teams who get revenue sharing, of which the Marlins are one, the Tampa Bay Rays are one, teams get a lot of money, tens of millions of dollars in revenue sharing, which is money coming from big market teams like the Yankees and going to small revenue teams like the Marlins. But the rule is in the collective bargaining agreement that revenue sharing dollars must be used to improve your on the field product. And what the union believed is that there were teams taking money and pocketing that money and not using it for on the field product because using revenue for on the field product means giving money to players in the union. Yes. So that's sort of the backdrop of the dispute between owners and the union. Right. And, and it wasn't just a union that believed this. It was fans. True. <laughs> true that. Okay. Yeah. So this Fans wasn't this was <laughs> this wasn't just some kooky theory that the agents and the players said, "Hey, wait a second. Jeffrey Lawyer is pocketing this money." No, we had eyes. We saw what was on the field. We understood a little bit about revenue sharing and we felt like holy hell, Jeffrey Loria is lining his pockets with Yankees and Red Sox money. So, of course you did. But it never actually ended up that way because what we had to do every year when you're a revenue sharing recipient, this is not talked about either, Mikey. Teams who get revenue sharing have to certify a letter to Major League Baseball and the union how those proceeds are being used. So I would write the letter and the letter would be Dear Bud and Tony or whoever was running the union, you know, Don Fear or Gene Orza, whoever it was. The Marlins got $42 million in revenue sharing, and we used it to, one, pay our number one draft pick, $3 million. Two, to improve our minor league system, because that counted as improving your on-field product. Three, we did not non-tender player X. So you go through a laundry list. It gets approved by the union, approved by the commissioner, and then you move on to the next year. It was just one of my annual jobs. I had to write this letter saying what we're using revenue sharing for. At the time, in a city that you're not talking about, because it's not Cleveland and not Miami, Pittsburgh was the team that was in trouble because Bob Nutting, the owner, was actually taking distributions. His real name, Bob Nutting. That's his name, actually. <laughs> and he still owns the team. Actually acknowledging distributions being taken. Jeffrey never got distributions. We never gave him money. Jeffrey whatever. never acknowledged getting it. I think that's Bob Nutting's mistake. No, there's not one 
time, one year when Jeffrey got a distribution. Now he got a management fee like every general partner of every partnership, which is totally different. Right. But he owned 95% of the team. Can, can I seize on that? Because I just always thought you guys were doing creative bookkeeping. And it, look, he had to write a check at the end of the year. You're very careful with the words that you're choosing. But we saw some of the rev share dollars. And I just had to think like this management fee. That's on public record. We have no idea what Jeffrey Loria gets paid this. He could get paid anything. Can't you just sort of shift some funds around and take from this budget? And at the end of the year, you say, well, Jeffrey Loria, in terms of an owner capacity, he had to write a check. But in terms of like a managing partner, oh, my God, he's paying himself quite the salary. Yeah, so that would be great because that would be like the Mets saying they lose $200 million a year as the Mets, but they get $300 million a year as owners of the Sportsnet New York. So therefore, as a group, assuming you own the same percentage of each, you're actually net positive. I agree. That would be amazing. But in Jeffrey's case, his management fee was a tenth of the losses. All it would do if he brought his management fee to zero is reduce the losses. Let me tell you that where that management fee came from. When he bought into the Expos, he owned only eight, uh, 12% of the team. But as the general partner of the team, of a huge partnership with a lot of partners, which is very normal, the general partner gets a management fee. It's what Claude Brochu, the general partner of the Expos, got before Jeffrey. So when Jeffrey did a partnership agreement, he got paid a management fee. When he moved to Florida, it was the partnership that moved, not Jeffrey. So Jeffrey had partners in Florida and was running the partnership. But that management fee is, you know, several million dollars, $3 million, $2.5 million, nothing compared to what the annual losses were. So, Gats here, live sports are back, and it's very possible that we may see an NBA playoff matchup between the Clippers and the Nuggets. That's why Manscaped has partnered with us to make sure your Nuggets are as safe as possible when that matchup happens. Manscaped is here to provide you the best tools for your grooming experience. The Lawnmower 3.0 is the best hygiene tool for the modern man. Their ceramic blade and skin safe technology reduces painful snags. Manscaped's Perfect Package 3.0 comes with the new and improved Lawnmower 3.0 waterproof cordless body trimmer, performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag for you to use when you are done quarantining. Also, Manscaped has just released their Shears 2.0 nail kit, which is the perfect add-on to the Lawnmower 3.0 trimmer. The Shears 2.0 is a luxury four-piece nail kit featuring tempered stainless steel tools, and it includes slash tip tweezers, rounded point scissors, fingernail clippers, and a medium grit nail file. It's got it all. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code LEBITARD at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. And use code LEBITARD to take your grooming game to the next level. Safety is at the heart of every Volvo. The Volvo XC60 SUV is designed for safer trips and for the road. The available pilot assist helps keep you centered on long stretches. And active bending lights help you see around curves on winding roads. Wherever you go, summer safely. Explore exclusive offers on the XC60 during the Volvo Summer Safely Savings Event. Visit volvocars.com slash US to learn more. Over 2.3 million people are in jail and prison today. Black Americans make up 40% of those incarcerated, despite making up only 13% of U.S. residents. This is not an accident. It's a consequence of decades of bad policy decisions. As we address systemic racism, we must address the crisis of mass incarceration. Joe Biden promised an ACLU volunteer that, if elected, he'd reduce incarceration levels by 50 percent. We need him to follow through on that promise, a commitment now to release anyone who has served half of a drug sentence would send a signal that he is serious. The ACLU believes our criminal legal system is broken, racist, and unjust. Our next president must fix that and can start by releasing those hurt by the misguided war on drugs. Paid for by the American Civil Liberties Union, Inc., rightsforall.org. And now another edition of Obvious News from GEICO. Obvious News! 
A study says that soft talkers do not make great radio personalities. We asked local librarian Steve Sage about this, and here's what he said. Honestly, I don't buy it. I think I make very captivating radio. Also in obvious news, GEICO makes it easy to save money and easy to manage your policy with the GEICO app. So switching is a really smart decision. How does Steve feel about this? I love the GEICO app. I use it all the time. That's obvious news from GEICO. Obvious news! So you've always maintained Jeffrey was losing money every year. And in reality, the only actual money he was gaining wasn't even real because it was just the franchise appreciating in value. But millionaires don't say millionaires and become billionaires by losing tens of millions of dollars every year. I just never believed that it's possible. Like the Miami Heat say they don't make money. That they broke even when the big three were here. And I just don't believe it. I, I just, this is... Business people don't get into business to lose tens of millions of dollars. And I understand sports franchises are, for the most part, vanity investments anyways. But it just doesn't make any sense to me. I feel like I'm getting got. I feel like there's some big secret that all these owners know. And they just say, yeah, man, I'm losing money. It's not the... In every form of life, millionaires use creative bookkeeping to game the system. Why wouldn't they game it with professional sports franchises? They do. So there's several factors if you really want to get technical. And the one, the first one is not at all. It's called the ego premium. That is what people will do when they own a franchise. It's sort of the price of joining a country club. And so you, you have to pay money to be a part of that club. And whether it's the cost of the team or the annual operation of the team. But there's several things you get when you lose money as a professional franchise. When you're the partner of a partnership that loses money, those losses flow down to you personally. So owners of teams get lo who lose money get to take those losses and apply them to the gains they have in their other lives, whether it's selling art. If you own a piece of art that you bought for a million and you sold it for two million, you have a million dollar tax to pay. But if you lost a million dollars on your baseball team, you can take that million dollar loss, apply it to the million dollar gain in art, and therefore you pay no tax on the gain in art. If you sell $400 million worth of Yahoo stock and you have a gain of $200 million, but you've got losses in the Mavericks of $200 million, then you do not have to pay the capital gain on your increase in Yahoo stock. Yeah. So there are absolute ben benefits to losses mm -hmm. that you can use where these owners would have huge tax liabilities and those tax liabilities get reduced by getting these losses. On top of that, and it, now we're getting terrible, but at, at early in the morning, there's something called depreciation. Mm. When you buy a franchise, you get to you get something called depreciation and amortization. And that is a tax concept where you look like you don't have losses, but you get losses and you can then use those losses. Yeah, I mean, my, my knowledge of this and you're I'm punching well above my weight class right now. I'm trying to keep up. I have an LLC, so I do have a basic understanding. Well, well. If I can see where you can sort of manipulate this system and where losses are actually good for you, then I got to imagine in, in certain respects. When you say good, let me just make sure you do the math. It's not dollar for dollar, right? Right. When you lose a dollar, the tax benefit you get from that dollar is not a full dollar. Right. It's just the ben the loss is not actually the full dollar. Right. Is the way to say it. So if me, who was never good at math, I went to Miami-Dade College and I did remedial courses. I hated math. So if I could figure out that the system could be manipulated. I got to imagine Jeffrey Loria is manipulating the system far better than I am. So I just, on the surface, I understand. You say, well, he, he had to write a check at the end of the year. But just common sense tells me Jeffrey Loria is making money every year. Whether it's, he, he, he's got to be, he can't be I'm losing paper. money year over year. So, so that's, now that's not true. Well, he, it, it's possible. So what happened was his investment in the team was such the reason why I kept working is that his initial investment in the team was low enough that with the money that he was losing each year, we would treat it like acquisition debt. We would say, all right, your basis, it's like you just bought the Marlins for 80 million. Okay. Now it's 90 million. All right. Now it's 120 million. You're doing million. a great job of trying to explain this one. Acquisition that, debt that's is... That's the mentality of it. Yeah. But at some point, if you don't have enough cash flow, why are the Mets selling right now? Well, I always thought because Bernie Madoff took the Wilpons and there was a divorce and they just don't have the operating cash flow. 
but their team is worth more and more money every year. Mm-hmm. Although in the pandemic, why would you sell when your team is not as worth as much as you want it to be? Because you no longer have the cash to actually fund the uh, the annual losses that you have been funding every year because you know you're making more in asset appreciation. But even though you would be making more this year if you're the Mets, the Wilpons are like, we, we don't have any more cash to wait for that asset appreciation. That's when a team sells. But look at Jeter's group. Their level of investment to start was so significant that for them to keep adding annual losses year after year, it's, it's a math equation that doesn't work because they don't think they'll get that out of the team if and when they sell in whatever number of years. That's why as teams trade now for these huge numbers, the appetite to lose money annually is going to decrease. Whereas old owners who have smaller entry numbers have a higher appetite to lose money annually. All right. Let's talk about, uh, we've talked about the business of baseball. Uh, I'm a little cross-eyed right now trying to follow. Again, I wasn't very good at math. Let's talk about the actual team, the Miami Marlins. Um, 500 now. Uh, I think they, they have more home wins on the road than they do at home. I think they only have two home wins at home they lose to the jays um last night Sixo sanchez is an exciting prospect lots of comparisons to jose fernandez what do you make of that comp i do not view him as jose fernandez but i've been told he has three pitches where jose had two you know sanchez has a chance to be a top of the rotation guy uh he has a different type of body than Jose. He has a different personality. Uh, when you see him on the field, he smiles a bit, but Jose just had this love of baseball and love of life that just, I, I, I have not compared any pitcher I've seen to Jose when he was alive. So, I mean, I just, I wouldn't make that. He looks to me to be more like Josh Johnson, hopefully without the injuries where he is a workhorse, where he can have a, a sub three RA. We, we don't take give enough credit to Josh Johnson. What a great pitcher he was. Dude, he just got hurt. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In terms of he had, I want to say, about maybe two and a half seasons there, where if he got injured, he would come back after a couple of weeks and it, and it, it wouldn't take too much away from him. But you don't have this epic list of great Marlins pitchers because they're not here long enough. Jose Fernandez, in terms of stuff and and performance and what could have been, I think most people say, well, that's the greatest pitcher in Marlins franchise history. But Josh Johnson, there's there's a real argument to be made. I'm curious as to who you would pick because right now, and I'm probably missing somebody, I think I'd say Josh Johnson, Josh Johnson is a pretty good argument when you're trying to discover who the best pitcher in Marlins franchise history is. As a career or as a Marlin? As a Marlin. Dempster's in there, too. Brad Penny, actually. Brad Penny might be the guy. Brad Penny was great. Beckett was great. Kevin Brown was great, but short. I mean, Al Leiter was great. All these guys have have short careers, so So the Marlins are a difficult franchise to do. Yeah, this has a... The Marlins have a difficult franchise to sort of name who's the best pitcher. I'm curious as to who you would Ricky Nolasco had a great career with the Marlins. He really did. Ricky Nolasco broke Brad Penny's record, right, for most wins. Or career for Marlins wins. Now, Josh Johnson was the best. He was so good, and he was such a cerebral guy. He opened the new ballpark, and he was the losing pitcher against the Cardinals in in the first game in, in April of 12. But his ball was so heavy. He had such great lower body. Tom Seaver just died last night, and people ask, who's your comp? to Tom Seaver in terms of pitching. Josh Johnson, for me, would be the comp because of the power stuff, because of the great lower body and strength that Josh Johnson had. That's what Tom Seaver was known for. If you've never watched Tom Seaver pitch because you're too young, he was incredible. Yeah, Roy Halladay has one of the more memorable perfect games. Now we live in an era where someone will throw a no-hitter and it won't even make Sports Center. Roy Halladay has one of those perfect games that people remember. I think it was because you guys sold the tickets. But entering that game, there was a feeling in the air that this was a legitimate possibility. And it might be Halladay or it might be Josh Johnson. Both pitchers were at the top of their game. We thought about the possibility of having double no hitters. When we had Jose pitch, when Josh Johnson would pitch, there were certain pitchers who we had. And when you're facing them, when Dontrell Willis faced Randy Johnson, I remember talking to the clubhouse staff. I was at that game. Were you that? That that was exciting. That was that, that was on ESPN. That was really the national sort of signal to everybody. Dontrell had a, uh, arrived. That was when he became a national story. It was a local story, and you started seeing a, a bump in the crowds. But when Randy Johnson and the Diamondbacks came into town, 
Uh, man, I could I would remember that game so vividly. And you started believing in the team because you guys won that game. I, I think Alex Cintron um, put them ahead uh, early on, and it was a comeback victory. I think I'm not exactly sure on the details, but I know I was at that game. I remember I was sitting in the fish tank. I was so excited about Dontrell Willis. I, I'm hoping that you guys have some good Dontrell Willis stories from your time over there as this is happening because that was super exciting. He actually made the All Star game. So he moved the needle more than Jose did financially. And Jose would draw more people, but it was at a lower average ticket price. So financially, when Don Trell started, more people bought higher price tickets than when Jose started. That's a that's a bit of a revelation right there, because I always thought Jose was probably the guy. It was either... It was a two-man race in that respect, but Dontrell, higher price tickets. Yeah, now that I think about it, Dontrell's probably... Although he wasn't that consistent, man. Dontrell like would go through these... Even in 03, even in 03, you guys weren't even playing him come the postseason because you couldn't really trust him. He was not in the rotation. Mm-hmm. He was put into the bullpen in the in the 03 postseason. Yeah, and he couldn't really be trusted. He would go through these peaks and valleys, and then he had he put together that great season where he lost out to Carpenter, where I'm sure you guys felt like he should have won Cy Young. He definitely should. That that bothered us. That, that's when we felt that the Marlins, we had won a World Series. Yes, we lost a few players, but then we signed a bunch of players, and we felt as though that writers were just so upset with the Marlins, so upset that we had won the World Series, so upset that we were successful at low payrolls, that they took it out on Dontrell. That was a season where we were furious, A, not to have made the playoffs, but the fact that Dontrell didn't get a Cy Young was a joke. He was unhittable. This is after 03. This is after the, the title, and we couldn't make the playoffs. And he, he was the best pitcher in baseball that year. Yeah, the Marlins, unfortunately, for Mar- and Marlins fans know this, they have – a lot of great players that have come through those doors. Not a lot of players that were great for a very long time for that franchise. I'm curious who you think that have, that you were a part of these Marlins teams, who among that group of players uh, under the, the Loria regime might actually get their Jersey retired by the Miami Marlins, because you look out there, there aren't a lot. (laughs) Well, there's zero. Is it, it, it's, is 16 honored. What's, what's the deal with number 16? Don't even get me started. I do it's, want to get uh, you started. This angers you, no, doesn't it? I'm not going to get started on Jose. I'm not going to talk about it. Okay. I'm really not. It's right. a joke. Uh, for, and I'm not talking about the statue. I'm talking about that the absolute two things happened that should not have happened. Period. One, Jeffrey did. And one, Jeter did. And they're both equally wrong. Number one, Carl Barger was the first president of the Florida Marlins franchise. He passed away before the Marlins could even play a game. The Marlins had retired number five in honor of Carl Barger. That was the first retired number. Logan Morrison, who I love, I traveled with him to visit the troops. We thought he could be great for us and it just didn't work out. He wanted to wear number five and Jeffrey unretired Carl Barger's number to give to Logan Morrison and it never got retired again. That's just wrong. You do not give a player retired number. I don't care what the player begs you to do, how much he wants to honor his own father who had passed away. Whatever the reason is, you don't unretire a number. Two, when you've got someone like Jose who passed away, and you are honoring him in the way that we were trying to honor him, whether it's with a statue that would be put in the East Plaza, which he is deserving of, or whether it is a retired number, whether it is some sort of plaque, whatever the case is, you don't screw around with that when you buy the team because you're so angry that you paid 1.2 billion. You don't do it. It's petty, it's wrong, and it's a joke. So and I, so this is not anti-Jeter. There are two situations with the Marlins that can never be undone because they were wrong and they can't be fixed. So there are no retired numbers. Sorry, Mike. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, me off. I hadn't thought about that. No, it's all right. And I, I saw you get a little heated and I know Jose is an emotional topic for you and you sort of nudged me away from pushing on it and i know you said you didn't want to get started and you kind of got well, started so carl barger yeah really um i didn't know carl barger but i was i i ran a franchise as the team president for 16 years 
it is sickening for me to think that a future president or owner would do something to undo what I had done. And I'm watching it happen when I'm alive. I would not undo what Heisinga did or what Carl Barger did or an honor that is bestowed upon people through an organization that would like if someone buys the Yankees from Steinbrenner eventually, and it's no longer in their family. And they say, you know what? There's too many damn retired numbers. If you want to wear number one, you know, just take number one. It's a joke. I, I can see why it's also a, a personal thing for you, not just because of the, the Jose connection that you had, but also when you put it in those terms, most people don't get to see themselves written away from history. That usually happens after they pass, and it's happened sort of instantly to you. So I can't even imagine how that how difficult that must be for you to process. I think we should end the podcast on your review this week because we had some really good stuff. I had all sorts of questions about the Mets sale as now they're moving into an exclusive negotiation um with steve cohen and i wanted to get your thoughts there but we'll save that for next week as well as this very interesting proposition about an mlb cup you know with my soccer roots that made me perk up when i was preparing for today because the audience may not know this your listeners we don't talk about the show before it happens i don't have the questions i don't know which direction it's going to go and you prod me to remember certain things that i don't think about and that's sort of your genius and what you do and then we have these funny conversations back and forth as i was thinking about things i would have guaranteed that you were going to bring up the baseball cup yeah. so it's funny that you didn't because as a soccer guy yeah how I could you not i love it and, and that's a good way to sort of make good with a lot of these minor league it's a very sad story what happened to minor league baseball obviously a lot of enterprises have been affected by the global pandemic uh, these small towns for the most part i know there's some larger markets affected by this too but minor league baseball um i, I just want to get with you probably next week on, on minor league baseball as a whole. Um, this is a good idea to help maybe recoup some of the, the lost money and the lost revenue for these markets. I see you holding up a little teeny tiny uh, space. This you don't think hardly this is first of all, let's give a preview for next week. The chances of the baseball cup happening are about as likely oh. as me dunking on a regulation hoop. No, Get, in, get get plyometrics going because I want to see I want to see this so bad because there is money to be made. This is an additional TV contract. You could sell it as a separate entity, and there's revenue sharing for smaller towns. I think it's a great idea. And you're a major league owner. You're gonna want your best pitchers pitching in a meaningless game against minor league teams. I will to the tune of maybe fifty million dollars in my pocket. Oh. Okay, I changed my mind. Is that the number that you think could come to each team? This is not Europe. Okay, what about $20 million? Yes. Yeah. It's not going to be $20 million a $15 team. million. Dollars. You, you see $15 million on the ground. You're not going to pick it up? It, can I pitch like my number five starter? <laughs> yeah. It'll, it'll be really funny when, when teams are having to play their own minor league affiliate and call up the minor league affiliate's best player to pitch against that minor league affiliate. You're going to have a bunch of upsets because baseball is random. You get a lot of upsets in soccer, hell, even when some of the top flight players are playing some lower division players. So I think it's a great idea. It's an additional television contract to sell $3 million. You don't see you see $3 million on the floor. You're not going to pick it up? Yeah, but not for the baseball cup. No. <laughs> It's going to have to be more than $3 million per team. All right. We didn't get your review last week. There wasn't one. Host of Nothing Personal, David Sampson, go out and check out that podcast. It is great. What is your review for the week? I want to do a documentary, and it's called Madman, the Steve Madden story. It's on Netflix. So Steve Madden is the person who I only knew from that he was a shoe guy because my kids liked Steve Madden shoes. And I didn't know that Steve Madden, this whole time before I watched this, I didn't know he was a person. You watch Wolf of Wall Street, though, right? But I thought it was, I did not know that was real. You thought that they just used so like a I, real person um, the, to the play actor, Steve Madden? They used an actor to play Steve Madden in Wolf of Wall Street. And I assumed that it was sort of part of the dramatic story that they took this kid and made him public. And he was a little kid because he was played by a really young actor who I had seen in some other shows. I thought it was Jason Reitman, but I think it's his last name is Gould. It could be uh, or something. He's not Jason Reitman. But in any case, I, it did not occur to me that the person Steve Madden 
I knew the company had gone public, but I thought they made up that it was Steve Madden. So this documentary taught me, A, that Steve Madden's a guy. I had no idea that it was real that the real guy went to prison. I had no idea he had become a prison, a, f- a convicted felon advocate, and that he hired people he met in prison. It reminded me of what Albert Brooks would have done if he could have to Don Cheadle in Out of Sight. In a different world, Albert Brooks would have hired Don Cheadle outside of prison and had him working with him. If you haven't watched Out of Sight and you're listening to this, watch it immediately with George Clooney and Jennifer Lopez and Albert Brooks and Don Cheadle and Ving Rhames. But Steve Madden in real life hired these men. And it is such an interesting story about a driven man who's obsessed with shoes and now has a convicted felon operating a huge part of his huge shoe business. And it was phenomenal. I enjoyed it. It's not very long. It was very informative. And it made me want to buy Steve Madden shoes, other than the fact that I realized that I can't buy Steve Madden shoes. They don't make male uh, Steve Madden shoes anymore because they did back in 03. I remember going a lot of Gettys where rocking my Steve Madden uncomfortable shoes looked like clogs. So, so they're very he's into platforms, right? But now he's doing sort of open toe shoes. He walks around, looks staring down at, at women's feet. I was not aware that I don't think again, maybe this is part two of the documentary. I don't think Steve Madden makes men's shoes. At least there was not one pair of men's shoes in the entire show. Well, I, I definitely had two pairs of Steve Madden shoes that I that I saw some Marlins playoff games and going over to friend's house watching the road. Did games. you know he was a real guy? Yeah, I knew Steve Madden was a real guy. I, I knew C. Madden was a real guy. Um, I, I know there are some companies that have like a, a real name that you just assume, oh, that's named after somebody and it's just totally fabricated. But after Wolf of Wall Street, because I knew that was sort of based on a true story, I didn't assume they made the C. Madden part up. So my takeaway from Wolf of Wall Street had nothing to do with the Steve Madden part, by the way. (laughs) I was far more focused on Margot Robbie and trying to figure out how that would all work because I was on Wall Street and I never saw Margot Robbie. (laughs) I never had any sort of midget tossing. I never had any of that. So that was disappointing. But in any case, I can only tell you that it's worth it to learn about his story. And especially now with what's going on in Florida with voting rights for convicted felons and how how. The, the impact that has and how you can actually get a second chance. And uh, it's, it really is worth watching. All right. And next week after your compliance video on what to call little people, uh, we will circle no, back. That's what it was called in Wolf of Wall Street. I know. I know. You're, you're helped by the context, but I, I just have to call Thank you out you on very that. much, Mikey. <laughs> All right. David Samson knows nothing personal. We'll talk next week about this MLB Cup. Uh, any, any chance? Uh, I mean, if you've listened to the local hours outside of the ones with you, I've always been arguing for the NBA to do this. So I got super excited because MLB be you're absolutely going to have a situation where the fort wayne tin caps can win the whole thing uh, david samson host of nothing personal thank you so much for the time heat talk and heat reaction coming up next on the big suey with a whole cast of characters we'll see you soon geico knows there are many reasons why you ride from the thrill of the revving engine and pure adrenaline of flying down the highway to the confidence of knowing that Geico always has your back with 24-7 access to claim service. But Ari Snyder has one reason in particular. I have extremely large upper arms. They won't even fit into most shirts. Thankfully, biking really embraces vest culture, so I feel accepted. Geico Motorcycle. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Motorcycle. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more.